Hi everyone. Um, in this video, in this video lecture, and in this week, we will cover lecture 15. Uh, lecture 15 PowerPoint slide has been uploaded on InCampus and is also attached in your email. But basically, this week we will be covering this lecture that talks about trade, that talks about comparative advantage and absolute advantage. Um, and you know, we, we learned about absolute advantage and comparative advantage in the beginning of the semester. You know, like in chapter two and three, uh, especially in chapter two. But in this chapter, we are going to um, take one step further and understand the underlying um, concepts and underlying uh, theories uh, for um, comparative advantage absolute advantage and then we also will look into why trade is so beneficial why we want to engage in trade uh, because all these things are connected um, okay so before we do that first we have to look understand what a gross domestic product or GDP means um, and most of you have already taken a macroeconomics class and you probably know what GDP means. GDP basically means it's the value of all final goods and services produced in an economy. Okay, so in a particular year, how, what is the value of all the final goods and services are produced? Um, it, it, it will include, you know, uh, what you're buying in Walmart, it will include your uh, paying for gas that is, because you're buying gas, so it will be included if you're paying tuition for educational services. These all these items will be included in GDP. Now, there are several ways to calculate the GDP in a particular year for a country or for an economy. Um, but it can be also for a state, but the most common way is the expenditure method and which is given by GDP is equals to C plus I plus G plus X minus M. Uh, again, um, most of you took macro class. This is probably uh, known to you, but I'm just doing a quick review. So it, it reminds your uh, memory as the GDP is very much connected to trade because trade ultimately increases your GDP. Okay, and um, so in this equation, the C represents personal consumption expenditures you know so any type of personal consumption like if you are if we are buying a car if we are going and buying grocery if we are paying um, um, tuition uh, for this course all these things are included under personal consumption now purchase of home that's not a consumption that we consider that as a, that as an investment so purchase of home is not included in under c then we have I, I represents gross private domestic investments. That basically means all the uh, you know investments made by the businesses. Now, if businesses are buying inventory, that's included under I. If businesses are made, trying to build a new office building, you know they are they are buying a land to build a new office building. That's an investment they are making. Okay. Um, then, if we are purchasing a home, that's an investment. So these are these all these items are included under. Um, the category I. Then we have G, which is government expenditure. You know, we learned about government expenditure a whole lot in our fiscal policy, um, you know, monetary policy in macroeconomics class. But basically, G it means all the types of government expenditures and government um, expenses. You know, whether if, if the government um, is opening a state park, if the government is creating a highway. Um, if the government is paying salary to the government employees, like if government is paying salary to the IRS staff or if the government is paying um, um, salary to the you know, immigration uh, people or customs people, these are all included under G. Um, so G represents all types of expenditures by the government as well as investments. So any investments by government, any expenditures by government. Then we have X, which is exports, and that's where trade starts to come in. Exports means basically when our when pro products and services are produced in the U.S. and these are purchased by foreign countries. So that's exports. You know, if Canada is buying computers from U.S., that's exports. If Canada is buying agricultural products from U.S., that's exports. Okay. So exports are added to GDP because these are produced within the U.S. but purchased by foreign countries. And then last we have M, which is imports. Imports is basically what these are goods that are produced in outside countries. And we as U.S. citizens or residents of U.S. buy these products. So let's say if U.S. citizens are buying goods from England. If U.S. citizens are buying 
um, you know, cosmetics or if U.S. citizens are buying, um, a, um, you know, Toyota cars from Jap Japan, that would be import. However, if that Toyota is manufactured in the U.S., then it will be part of the U.S. GDP, okay? But if the car was manufactured in Japan and we are purchasing that car from Japan, then it is an import, right? This, that good was not produced in the U.S. It was produced in the Japan and we are purchasing it. So that's one of the reasons why we will subtract imports from the uh, G total GDP. We don't add it because we are paying other countries. We are not paying our country. So um, again, it's, it's, it's called the expenditure approach. And when we add all these five category categories, we end up with the GDP of the uh, economy in a particular year. Okay, so U.S. has the largest GDP, um, or basically U.S. is the um, is the biggest nation that has the largest GDP. Um, it is also the largest trade importer and second largest exporter. Okay, so let me do a quick example of how to calculate um, GDP under the, using this formula, so you guys can understand um, the example. Okay, so assume you are given information for 2017 for US, okay? And you are given consumption is 40 billion, investment is 25 billion, and all government expenditure and investment is 15 billion in that particular year, exports are 17 billion but imports are even greater it's 23 billion because in US is the largest importer of goods and services okay now given this information what is the GDP so we know GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus X minus M so we just take these numbers 40 billion consumption plus investment is 25 billion Plus government is 15 billion plus exports is 17 billion then we subtract imports which is 23 billion okay and if we do that we end up with 74 billion so the GDP of the US in 2017 is 174 billion based on this method so hopefully this is very, you know, it's very uh, straightforward. So hopefully you can, if I give you an example like this in an MCQ in an exam, you will be able to calculate the GDP. So moving on. So US, U.S. exports goods and services throughout the world, but exports are mostly done to Canada, Mexico, Japan, China, and the United Kingdom. It mostly consists of agricultural products, chemicals, and capital goods. Now capital goods means you know, air conditioners, computers, and furniture, stuff like that, okay? So recently, the EU, the European Union, has expanded, and Britain has voted to exit out of the European Union. Now, this is creating a lot of issues, whether Britain should stay with EU or whether uh, Britain should separate out, and because this is going to create a lot of um, trade issues. You know, economies who support that Britain should stay with you EU suggests that the breakup between EU and Britain will decrease overall trade because of fewer economies of scale okay what will happen is basically when Britain and EU will separate out their overall demand for <laughs> their goods will go down so they will start reducing their production and as a result economies of scale will go down while the supporters you know, of the split between Britain and EU suggest that this will allow Britain to have more flexibility in creating new trade agreements. Like they are, uh, when they are with EU, they have to follow the rules and regulations of EU. If they are separated out, they can create their own new trade agreements with other countries. 
So, you know, um, there are both sides of the coin and, you know, we, Britain just got separated. Um, so we, we have to see how it plays out. Uh, but there are two sides of the coin as well. Like U.S. Ha also has many free trade agreements. You know, we had the NAFTA, but right now it was canceled by President Trump. Then we have Israel. We have Jordan. We have um, free trade agreements with Australia, Chile, etc. You know, the main purpose of these trade agreements, when countries have trade agreements with other countries, the main purpose is basically to promote comparative advantage and friendship as well as democracy. Okay. Basically, one, the one country trades with another country to promote comparative advantage. You know, we discussed so whoever has the opportunity cost, lower opportunity cost, that country will produce the product and, um, you know, get import the product from the other, uh, import the other product from the other country. And then it also uh, promotes friendship and democracy between the country. So why trade? You know, countries engage in trade because there are economic advantages to gain from unavailable resources by exchanging for abandoned resources. Okay, so what it is first, one of the first advantage of trade is maybe U.S. does not have some of the resources they need, they want. Uh, they, 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 those are very limited, but those are available in Canada. So trade will allow them to get the limited resources from Canada in return from the abandoned resources they have. So that's what trade is. Basically, you know, I will sell my products to Canada and Canada will sell their products to me. Maybe in my country, I don't have some of the resources. They are limited, but Canada has abandoned resources of those and I need those. So what I can do is I can buy those from Canada and in return, I can um, sell my abandoned resources to Canada. Okay. For instance, like U.S., has abandoned agricultural output. You know, U.S. has a lot of agricultural output, but they don't have a lot of oils. So they can trade agricultural output for oil. Okay, so that's one of the advantages. If we don't have uh, the economic resources and we can gain those economic resources that are unavailable to us um, through trade. That's the first advantage. Second advantage is trade also provides economies of scale and labor, pro pro labor specialization. Okay, so what that means is, remember, economies of scale means when we increase our production, the average cost decreases, and thereby we start in enjoying economies of scale. We learned it in a couple of previous chapters, right? So what it's saying is because of trade, there will be more demand, right? If I am only selling my products in Texas versus if I am selling my products all over U.S. and Canada and Mexico, then the demand for my product will be more, right? So when there is more demand, I will increase my output. And as my output increases, the average cost decreases. So that's how I will be able to enjoy greater economies of scale. And additionally, this will result in the labor to specialize, you know, because countries, uh, because countries who are like who have low opportunity costs uh, on, on goods, they will only produce those goods. So let's say agricultural products, U.S. has abandoned agricultural products. So the labor will get specialized in producing agricultural products, while Canada, let's say they have oil, the employees or the people or the labor in Canada will get specialized in producing oil because they will be focusing on producing oil and imports agricultural products from U.S., while U.S. will be focusing on producing agricultural products and they can import the oil from um, Canada. So that's how it benefits. It basically creates more economies of scale and it also brings about labor specialization. And this ultimately leads to an increase in standard of living for both the countries based on lower opportunity cost. So according to Adam, Adam Smith, the father of economics, he said that the national well, economic well-being depends on the role of trade, competition, and limited government. Basically what he is saying as economy, we, an economy will grow over the years if we have limited government, if we have a lot of competition, and if there is trade. So trade is one of the factors that will cause the economy to grow just shutting out the borders to other um, uh, you know shutting out the borders uh, for other countries probably does not make sense in today's world okay the theory of absolute advantage was first 
economic model of beneficial trade. So Adam Smith came up with the absolute advantage model. And if you remember, we talked about it. What it says, the country that is more efficient in producing a good should produce that. Or basically the country that can produce more units of goods with the same amount of resources has absolute advantage over the other country. Right. So that's what absolute advantage was. Um, you know, if you remember, let's say, let me give you this example. Let's say we're looking at absolute advantage. And this is one of the first models for, uh, you know, that gave us the benefits of what that arise from trade. So absolute advantage was based on trade. OK, so what it says is, let's say with the same amount of resources. Same amount of resources. OK, let's say U.S. Can either produce. Two units of pen or because resources are limited we cannot use it for everything so either they can produce two units of pen or one unit of notebook okay on the other hand Canada with the same amount of resources with the same amount of resources Canada can produce one unit of pen or two units of notebook. Okay, so based on this, we can say based on the absolute advantage model, which basically says, you know, um, with the same amount of resources, if a country is more efficient in producing a good, then that country has absolute advantage, right? So in this case, USA has absolute advantage for pen. Because with the same amount of resources, USA can produce two pens versus Canada can only produce one pen, okay? On the other hand, Canada has absolute advantage Canada has absolute advantage on notebook right again look at this Canada can produce two units of notebook versus USA can only produce one unit of notebook with the same amount of resources. So basically ad absolute advantage model says that, you know, the country that has more, the country with the same amount of input, if they can produce more output, then that country is efficient um, and has absolute advantage. So in terms of pens, US has absolute advantage. In terms of notebooks, Canada has absolute advantage. OK, so hopefully this gives you an idea of what uh, absolute advantage means. It's a quick recap of what we did in chapter two. Nothing new so far. OK, but we want to take this equation uh, to the next level so that we understand the cost ratios and we understand the limits of trade which are needed to understand the comparative advantage model. OK. So we will use this same equation or same information to move on to the to go further into it. OK. So again, if you remember, we were given with. OK, so for USA. And Canada okay so let's say we were given with this information pen and notebook right that's what it was given in our last in the last uh, whiteboard I was doing and let's say pen is given by X notebook is given by Y okay so if in USA 
they produce two pens let's say USA decides to produce two pens in that case they cannot produce the pen because resources are limited they can either produce two pens or one pen so if they decide to produce two pens they can only they can produce zero zero notebook okay so if they are producing two pens then they will produce zero notebook because they are using all the resources to produce two pens okay however if they decide that they will produce one notebook then they will end up producing zero pens right because again the resources are limited they can either choose to produce pens or they can either choose to produce notebook same way if we look at Canada okay and let's say again pen is X notebook is Y and if you remember if Canada produces two notebooks then they can only produce zero pens if Canada produces one pen they can produce zero notebooks because resources are limited this is the table matrix table we have and from this table we will get the cost ratios and then we will get the limits of trade okay so it's very easy okay it's very easy what we do is look we I said pen is X notebook is Y okay so what we will do is we here in order to produce two pens we are actually giving up one notebook correct so you know because when we are producing two pens we cannot produce that one notebook or the other way if you see in order to produce one notebook we have to give up two pens right in other words we can write 2x is equals to 1y because in order to produce two pens which is x we are giving up one notebook or the other way in order to produce one notebook which is why we are giving up two pens okay same way for Canada in order to produce one pen we are giving up two notebooks so X in this case will be equals to two Y right to produce to give up one pen which is X we are giving up two notebooks which is two Y so these are known as the cost ratios okay so you have to know this these are known as the cost ratios so this is one of the first things that we have to know in order to see we, who should trade what product okay and one thing to remember the higher this coefficient is higher the coefficient the higher the efficiency so in this case you know here x is equals to 2y but here we can see x is equals to half y right here the coefficient is half and here the coefficient is 2 which probably means Canada probably has more is more efficient than you know so the higher it is the higher the efficiency okay so then moving on for trade to benefit each nation the exchange must be within the limits of trade the limits of trade are those initial cost ratios positions that each nation has at self-sufficiency expressed in terms of one variable this is also the opportunity cost of producing one good compared to another for a given nation so basically you know first we find out the matrix the second step we find out the cost ratio once we have the cost ratio we then try to figure out the limits of trade that's what it is limits of trade basically means um, you know it, it means the opportunity cost of producing one good compared to another good so now we are coming up with the opportunity cost, cost opportunity cost concept which was introduced by David Ricardo if you remember um, so the third step is to find out the limits of trade and the limits of trade are basically expressed in terms of the opportunity cost and we derive these limits of trade from the cost ratios so if you remember again the cost ratios here we know for USA the cost ratio was okay so let's say for USA 
the cost ratio was if you remember from the previous slide for USA the cost ratio was 2x is equals to y okay and then for Canada the cost ratio was x is equals to 2y right this is just based on what we did so before we look at the limits of trade first we have to understand it in terms of the budget constraint or in terms of a graph so we understand what's going on okay and what is the budget that's given okay so if this is the cost ratio let's say what is the graph for USA okay so we look at the graph this is let's say um, on the on the <clears throat> on this side we have the y-axis which is notebooks okay notebook is y and on x-axis we have pens which is x okay so let's say for USA the equation is y is equals to 2x okay so that means basically what it means is basically when um, when so basically it says when x is equal to 0 it's y I can either produce y I can either produce one notebook okay or I can either I can use all my input to produce two pens okay so that's my budget constraint for us right again look at this think of it like this with the same amount of resources I can either produce two X pens or two pens which is this with the R with the same amount of resources I can I can produce one notebook so it's either this or this so that's the budget constraint for US now let's do it for Canada okay again the X axis is pens and Y axis is notebooks and from the equation we can either produce one pen okay or we can produce two y right with the same amount of resources we can either produce one pen or we can choose to produce two notebooks so this is how the budget constraint of the Canada will look like look at this this one is much more steeper this one is much more flatter okay so this is a graph that will help you to understand that the US can operate only within inside the graph they, they cannot go beyond the graph because that's not attainable again here Canada can operate within this graph within this PPF the production possibility frontier they cannot go beyond this curve because we don't have those resources right now this is again knowledge from based based on your previous lectures so again from this from the cost ratio we get the graphs and from the graphs we will get the limits of trade which we just said is the opportunity cost of producing one good um, um, or in terms of the other good okay so here so if we just go down from here we will do the limits of trade okay now let's say for US limits of trade for US so we start with the cost ratio okay so for US the cost ratio was 2x is equals to y so it is the opportunity cost okay so if we are looking at x the limit of trade trade is x is equals to half y this is the limit of trade for US okay and for Canada the limit of trade was x is equals to 2y we already know that because it was already expressed in terms of x so these two equations this and this are known as the limits of trade and they are representing the opportunity cost again look at this in order to produce one pen we are giving up half notebooks in US now in Canada in order to produce one pen we are giving up 
two two notebooks so it's the opportunity cost right in order to produce one x we are giving up half notebooks in canada we are in order to produce one a pen we are giving up two notebooks so we are expressing these in terms of the opportunity cost and that is what it is known as limits of trade now what david ricardo is saying is as long as the limits of trade equations are different for the two countries then trade is beneficial if they are the same then trade does not make any sense or it's not, it, it does not make sense to trade with that country. So as long as these two equations are different from one another, the country should engage in trade. If they are exactly the same, they should not engage in trade. So in this case, they are different, so they should engage in trade. But if they are same, they should not engage in trade. Okay. So if the opportunity costs are the same, neither nation neither nation can benefit from trade the opportunity cost for trade opportunity for trade is the comparability of possible benefits from the exchange of different ratios and if the cost ratios are the same then there is no benefit to share you know it's the same thing we can just produce it in home and still incur the same cost so it does not make sense to buy it from a different country because we already have these resources and we can and for us is the same opportunity cost okay so an example would be let's say you know let's say us has a limits of trade function of x is equals to 0 0.25 y Let's assume X and Y are two different products. Let's say this is computer. And let's say this is, you know, screens. Okay, just as an example. And same way, let's say Mexico, Mexico's limits of trade is given by same X computers for one computer we give up 0 0.25 screens so in this case look the equations the limits of trade equations are exactly the same so benefit of trade does not exist there's it does not make sense for us and mexico to engage in trade for computer and screens because usa can just do the same thing by producing it in-house in their own country they don't have to go go to mexico to get screens or to get computers okay so hope that explains what's going on okay now the terms of trade which we move on to the next term after the limits of trade we move on to the terms of trade the terms of trade describe the units of goods given up for those goods received okay it's also known as the exchange ratio the terms of trade must be within the limits of trade okay so terms of trade means basically what it means is let's say i'm giving 20 computers to Canada in return how much how many screens I'm getting from Canada so that's terms of trade basically what is the term what is basically my price in other words price or what is the term I am offering to Canada when I'm selling my computers so that's the terms of trade so first step is when we are given with an information is to put that information in the matrix second step is to find out the cost ratio third step is to draw the graph and then we find out the limits of trade and then finally we look at the terms of trade you know and the exact terms of trade are market derived and it will depend on the value each nation places upon the items to be traded you know it will depend how much usa is valuing a particular type of good versus how much canada is valuing a particular type of good and again we will do our example in details so you guys are clear on this um, and you know basically now we will focus on doing an example okay so let's do um, an example um, starting from the very beginning you know um, calculating the cost ratios drawing the graphs and then coming up with the limits of trade and finally we look, look into how to calculate the terms of trade or how do we know about the terms of trade and then based on that we basically um, and based on that we will basically see how trade will gain 
two countries okay so let's start from the very beginning so you guys are clear let's say we have it's I'm, I'm doing a new example let's say we have two a, a, a countries England okay and then we have let's say Portugal okay now with the same resources again let's say both countries have the same amount of resources or inputs England can produce either 30 clothes so England can either produce 30 clothes or 10 wine okay and on the other hand with the same amount of resources Portugal can produce 30 clothes or 30 wine okay so this is given to us now if we if I ask you who has absolute advantage on clothes in that case both England and Portugal has absolute advantage because with the same amount of resources they can produce the same amount of clothes 30 clothes nobody has a greater um, uh, limit or nobody has a greater amount compared to the other country but if I say who has the absolute advantage on producing wine in that case Portugal has absolute advantage because with the same amount of resources they can produce 30 wines whereas England can only produce 10 wines so in terms of absolute advantage Portugal has absolute advantage on wine and for clothes it's indifferent uh, either England or Portugal both has absolute advantage okay so the first step is to draw the PPF of both the countries okay so let's look at England here okay and look at Portugal here okay so based on the problem I gave England can either produce 30 clothes or 10 wines so let's say clothes is on y-axis wine is on x-axis okay so England can either produce 30 clothes or England can produce 10 wines right that's based on what we know okay on the other hand for Portugal it's the same thing we have clothes here we have wines here but with the same amount of resources Portugal can either produce 30 oh man it's so tough to write with these with this you know I'm sorry about that but Portugal can produce 30 clothes or Portugal can produce either 30 clothes or 30 wines okay so their one will be more flattened out because they can produce their PPF will be more flattened out or more expanded compared to the PPF of England so that's the first step okay now the second step is to compute the cost ratios okay so cost ratios it's easy to calculate right we can produce like England for England the cost ratio is 30c equals 10w right either they can produce 30 clothes or they can produce 10 um, wines so in order to produce 30 clothes they have to give up 10 wines okay on the other hand for Portugal the cost ratio is 30 clothes equals 30 wine because in order to produce 30 clothes they have to give up 30 wines or you know the uh, uh, other ways you know they can either produce 30 clothes or they can uh, uh, produce 30 wines so that's our cost ratio that's the second step now the third step we move on to create the limits of trade which is expressed in terms of the opportunity cost right so let's say we will focus on wine in this case so for in terms of wine for England what is the opportunity cost to produce one unit of wine so let's calculate to produce 10 wine 
the country has to give up 30 clothes. And to produce one wine, the country has to give up 30 divided by 10, 3 clothes. So, the limit of trade for England is W equals to 3C. That is the limit of trade for England. Now, same thing we repeat for Portugal. Again, we are looking at wine first. So, to produce 30 wine, Portugal is going to give up 30 clothes. So, to produce one wine, Portugal will give up 30 divided by 30 equals to one clothes. And the limit of trade for Portugal is equals to W equals C. So, to produce one wine, we give up one cloth. In England, to produce one wine, we give up three clothes. So the opportunity cost to produce wine in England is higher, whereas the opportunity cost to produce wine in Portugal is lower. So based on that, what is what is what what did we learn? The country that has the lower opportunity cost should produce that should produce that good. And the other country should trade it from there based on the comparative advantage, right? So based on this, basically here we can say Portugal should produce wine. Okay. Now, how much should Portugal charge? You know, how much should Portugal charge to US or to um, uh, to uh, England? You know, Portugal's cost is one cloth. Opportunity cost is one cloth. Whereas for England, the opportunity cost is three costs, uh, three clothes. Okay. So Portugal, in order to make trade beneficial, in order for the trade to make sense, Portugal will charge or the terms of trade for Portugal will be, basically they will be greater than 1C, but less than 3C for one wine, okay? When they are trading, when they are trading, so when, they are, when Portugal is trading wine with England, they will charge greater than 1C because if they charge equal to one cloth it does not make sense they are they are at that opportunity cost so they are not making any profit they're they're at cost okay but they are going to charge less than three clothes because if they are charging more than three clothes then for England, it does not make any sense, right? They can just produce it in-house if it is more than three clothes. If the opportunity cost is more than three clothes, they can produce it in-house or go to a different country with lower opportunity cost. So they will charge less than three clothes for one wine. In this way, Portugal is making profit by charging greater than the opportunity cost, right? They're charging greater than their opportunity cost. In the same way, England is also benefiting from the trade because they are paying probably two clothes England is probably paying two clothes whereas their in-house cost was three three clothes so they are also saving money so that is how this is the terms of trade for wine so terms of trade for wine okay so that's what terms of trade for wine is. Now, same way, we can ask you what is the terms of trade for clothes. Okay, so now we are asking you to express the equation in terms of clothes. Okay, so again, we know for England, the equation is W equals to 3C, or in other words, C is equals to one third, one third W. Okay, that's in terms of clothes. Okay, so far we have looked at in terms of wine. Now we are looking in terms of clothes. So for to produce one cloth, England has to give up one third wine. Whereas on the other hand, for Portugal to produce one cloth, he the country still needs to give up one wine. So it's one. 
So who has lower opportunity cost? One third versus one. So definitely England has lower opportunity cost. Uh, so England should produce clothes because the opportunity cost is lower. And they should, Portugal should get clothes from England. So if that's the case, what is the terms of trade for clothes? What price the England should charge to Portugal or what is the terms of trade the England should charge to Portugal in order to sell the clothes and in order to make a trade beneficial in this case basically again look at it if for England to make sense they will charge anything the terms of trade will be anything greater than one-third wine but less than one wine okay because if england is charging greater than one third wi wine to portugal they are making profit their cost is one third wi wine so they are charging more than that so they can make profit but it has to be less than one wine because if it is more than one wine it does not make sense for portugal to get clothes from england because they can produce it in-house it's probably cheaper uh, for portugal to produce it in-house so but if they are charging something less than one wine then portugal is saving money right if they were to produce in in-house they would have to give up one wine but now they are probably going to get it at less than one wine if they are trying to get it from england so that's the terms of trade or in other words the price um, which we express in terms of the opportunity cost so this is the terms of trade for clothes And the one we saw above, this one, is the terms of trade for wine, okay? This is for wine, and this is for clothes. So I hope you understand what terms of trade now means. It's basically expressed in terms of opportunity cost and how much each country should charge um, to one another okay but I want to take this step once uh, I want to take this process one step ahead to explain you how it benefits how actually the trade is benefiting both the countries I want you to show that I know I told you that they are saving both Portugal is making money and England is saving money in terms of wine and in terms of clothes England is making some money and Portugal is saving some money by getting clothes from England but I wanted to quantify these numbers and show you how trade actually benefits both the sides okay so just keeping the same examples okay let's say you know now we know that England will produce clothes based on the information we did we know England will produce clothes and <coughs> Portugal will produce um, wine so again if we go back to the PPF this is for England this is for Portugal now we know who has the lower opportunity cost in which item England has lower opportunity cost in clothes so they will produce 30 clothes whereas we know Portugal has lower opportunity cost in wine so they will produce 30 wine but how much are they getting um, by trading from Portugal like how much England is getting how many wine England is getting by trading with Portugal or how many clothes Portugal is getting by trading clothes with England okay now in general we know from the beginning this is how it was if there was no trade we would have something like this right if there was no trade England can either produce 30 clothes or 10 wines Portugal can either produce 30 clothes or 30 wines because resources are limited they cannot do uh, the same thing at the same time so that is their production possibility frontier and that is the maximum boundary without trade now we decided now we figured out England is going to produce clothes only and Portugal is going to produce wine only because they have low opportunity cost in those respective goods so how will it affect the output okay 
so that's what I wanted to show you okay so assume the terms of trade or assume the term of trade is actually between the two country is given by 30 clothes is equals to 20 wine okay so assume that's the terms of trade that's given okay we assume that this is the term of trade so what that means is if England exports 30 clothes they will get 20 wines so that's the terms of trade so what it means is basically if England is producing 30 clothes right so when they are producing 30 clothes in return from Portugal because of the terms of trade they will get 20 wine okay so let's say that's the term of trade so what does that mean they are producing 30 clothes right but from Portugal they are actually getting 20 wines look at this in the graph we have an increase in the PPF the PPF has shifted to the right now because of trade before it was at 10 here now because of trade we moved on to 21 because of trade we can now get higher amount of um, a higher amount of um, uh, wine from Portugal so that's why the PPF has shifted to the right so this trade definitely makes sense for England because they are paying less for wine number one and number two they are getting more quantity of wine by trading with Portugal okay if this is let's say the terms of trade now how about for Portugal does it make sense for Portugal so if we look at if we look at in case of Portugal's okay so let's say with the same terms of trade you know so to produce 20 wines when Portugal produces 20 wines they get 30 clothes when but in reality Portugal is producing 30 wines right so if Portugal is producing 30 wines how many clothes are they going to get so if they are producing 20 wines they get 30 clothes if they are producing one wine they will get 30 by 20 and if they are producing 30 wines which we which they are because they are specializing in wine now we have 30 times 30 divided by 20 which is equals to 45 clothes so by trading 30 wines they are now getting 45 clothes which means if we go up they were getting 40 clo 30 clothes before now because of trade they are getting 45 clothes so again the PPF shifts and we have this extra area or the PPF shifts to the right and we have this extra area which benefits Portugal because they are paying less for clothes by getting it from England and at the same time they are getting higher quantity which shifts the PPF curve to the right so see trade makes sense for both the parties right this is basically the benefit that England is getting from by trading is this area right and the benefit that Portugal is getting by trading is this area so definitely trade makes sense they are saving costs or they're making profit and at the same time they are getting greater quantities of the resources that they don't have a comparative advantage on okay so hopefully this is clear I know it's a lot but probably it's you know this example will help you to understand why we engage in trade and why we do do this you know so again if you look at it um, when England is producing 30 clothes they will get 20 wines so instead of 10 wines they're getting 20 wines on the opposite side if if um, uh, Portugal is producing 30 wines then they will get 45 clothes which is also more than 30 clothes so both the parties are um, in a win-win situation under trade okay so then you know we talk about the dynamics of trade the exchange of goods and services within the global community is highly dynamic new markets emerge and old production methods improve with new efficiencies right because of new technology new types of um, uh, demand from the people new markets emerge and the old production methods also get improved because of more efficient systems more efficient technology and all that for the US 
<laughs> growth in export trade will continue in areas such as medical technology and medical services medications entertainment computer technologies and legal that's what the economists are predicting now the law of increasing cost in trade this what this law says is that as nation increases output for export the cost eventually begins to increase because of the law of increasing costs what it means is as we are engaging in trade we are producing more and more right as we are engaging let's say we were only trading with canada but now us is trading with let's say canada mexico brazil england portugal so as we are engaging in more and more trade we have more demand from these countries so our output goes up and eventually i know as we produce more our average cost starts going down but eventually after some point because of the law of increasing cost the cost will start to go up the cost of production increase as a nation increases output because the most efficient input resources are used first and then less efficient resources must be employed so what happens is up to a certain point we are using these resources or we are using the most efficient resources once we go beyond that point we start using less efficient resources and as a result our cost starts going up and if you remember if we go back to the average cost marginal cost uh, theories that we learned in uh, our previous chapter if the average cost starts going down but after some point it starts going up again and that's because of this because now after that point we are using less efficient resources so as costs increase other nations have the opportunity to export that item because their cost will be comparative le comparative less so when i my cost will go up probably i will no longer have comparative advantage on that product and a different country will take up that opportunity so thus you know the specializing specialization is incomplete for a country uh, with any export because their cost in advantage will eventually disappear because of the increase law of increasing cost at one point you will lose um, your be best situation or the comparative advantage situation and that's why specialization is incomplete so if trade is beneficial why should there be trade restrictions we saw that trade is beneficial both countries are um, uh, benefiting you know portugal and england usa or canada both countries benefited then why do sometimes government say there should be trade restrictions such as there should be tariffs there should be embargoes um, you know we should not we should we should not engage in um, uh, too much trade why is why do we have those trade restrictions um, you know in order to benefit from trade the nation must adjust to market needs and efficiency some individuals do lose jobs and do lose some markets so that's one of the main reasons why we have trade restrictions okay also there is an opportunity cost of interdependency through trade when one nation trades with an another there's some sort of interdependency both economically and politically so we are becoming dependent on another country for a product so that's a disadvantage right we don't want to be too much dependent on one single country for a product um, so you know that's one of the reasons why we have you know and then we lose jobs some firms lose their market so these are some of the reasons why we have trade restrictions okay so each trading nation has a unique culture that defines the social system okay so the way we do business we have a culture we have a certain attitude uh, towards that you know the and it's different from country to country okay world trade is challenged because of these differences in culture and society you know because it requires communication and conformity to economic principles let's say for instance you know us china and saudi arabia they trade a lot but they have very different culture they have very different society on how things might be dealt so you know that lead that brings up the complicacy of trade you know or obstacles another obstacle is the monetary differences you know the differences in currency such as us has us dollars england has um, uh, pounds canada has canadian dollars so, so these um, currencies have different values and when we are trading across the borders we have uh, problems with these monetary differences finally you know government does controls you know to stop trade in order to limit trade and they mainly do it to protect domestic markets and you know many government construct trade barriers through tariffs quotas license and non-tariff barriers so these are some of the ways trades can be 
restricted tariffs, quotas, license, and non-tariff barriers. In the next slide, we will look into these specifically. So tariff is basically the most widely used trade restriction. If you see a couple of months back, uh, President Trump said he's putting new tariffs on imports from China. So what does that mean? Or, you know, it's a kind of it's kind of a re trade restriction. What it means are these are taxes imposed on imported goods. So whenever we are trying to buy goods from China, there will be a higher tax amount on those goods, which will make the good more expensive. Okay, so it increases the prices, this, this, this tariff increases the prices to consumers, but ultimately it results in more inefficient domestic production. You know, it, it causes inefficient domestic production and violates the benefits of trade. So tariff, uh, sometimes it's used, but you know, it's not that very efficient. Then we have quotas. Quotas means we set a limit of the quantity of goods we're getting from a country let's say um, uh, us puts a quota of um, on japan for cigarettes what that means is every year uh, we can only import 100,000 cigarettes from japan not more than that so it sets a limit it quantifies the uh, it gives it quantifies the amount so it this is more limiting than tariff because it pro, it sets an absolute limit on import okay then we have an embargo it's kind of like an economic tool um, in order, basically, people usually put embargo or countries usually put embargo when they have um, con political conflicts between one another, you know, such as U.S. and Cuba. The U.S. has put an embargo on Cuba. What that means is it's a complete prohibition of trade. There's no imports or exports between Cuba and U.S. So embargo is complete prohibition of trade, no imports, no exports. And again, this is usually done when there are political conflicts and political reasons. Finally, there are other non-tariff barriers, you know, other types of um, taxes. You know, it can include tax, it can include regulations, it can include penalties. And these are usually applied in the name, name of health concerns. So you have to know this slide. There will be questions from this uh, on your MCQ. So make sure you know this slide. So why do trade barriers exist? You know, developing nations have a small economic base and the loss of manufacturing or agricultural production might drastically impact the na entire nation. Let's say Costa Rica is a small country and they, have a, they are a developing country and they are based on agriculture. Now, but let's say U.S. is such a huge country and they have comparative advantage on agriculture. If... Costa Rica is engaging in trade with U.S., what will happen? The entire agricultural industry of um, uh, Costa Rica will collapse because it's a small economic nation that depends on agriculture. And if people start buying those products from U.S., then the b local businesses will fall apart. So that's why trade barriers exist. You know, these protected areas of economy are therefore protected by politicians. You know, they want to protect their local businesses. Um, you know, another major reason for trade barrier is in especially in developed countries such as US is due to special interest groups, you know, maybe large lobbying. They have large lobbying groups. They go to the government and tell, hey, put tariffs so we can make more money. We can make more profit. So that's another why, reason why we have trade barriers. It can also exist due to political tensions, you know, like Cuba and US, they have political tensions. So there is an embargo. Economic barriers are created to provide political influence. It is a lot of these trade barriers are associated with um, political reasons, but it ultimately results in costly for the consumers, for the, you know, whichever countries are involved, it ultimately affects the consumers. Now, pro barrier arguments, what that means is the arguments in favor of the trade barriers. The people who support trade barriers, they come up with these arguments. They say that trade restrictions are needed because, first of all, we need military self-sufficiency. You know, we cannot be too dependent on another country in terms of military. We have to be military self-sufficient. So in case any other country attacks, we can defend ourselves. Okay, so that's one. It is a political argument. The second one is domestic employment argument. The, the, this, this argument suggests that, you know, trade ultimately decreases jobs within the country um, and, you know, imports eliminate um, jobs. Okay, so because we are importing goods, those goods are no longer, uh, let's say, you know, Portugal is importing clothes from England. 
but that means nobody in Portugal will be producing clothes. So there, there is a loss of um, jobs for tailors and for people who work in the garments. Okay. And then lastly, another argument in favor of trade restriction is protecting the infant industry. What that means is basically, you know, it's a temporary protection for a short period of time for a new industry. Let's say we came up with um, an innovation of a medicine and now the government wants to protect this industry until it uh, creates its own market and it, and it has an established clientele and it has already started making profit. So that's another reason it wants to protect upcoming uprising or new industries from international trade. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to survive with so much competition from outsiders. OK, so the argument that trade barriers protect a domestic standard of living suggests that trade barriers protect jobs. However, real wages are determined largely by productivity. You know, it's not by protecting jobs, real wages are protected. It's largely determined by productivity. So economic growth results from um, efficiency and engaging in trade. Now, the direct effects of tariff, when, when uh, a country imposes tariff, what are the direct effects? It increases domestic production. No, it does increase domestic production, but at the same time, it will increase the price and there will be a decrease in consumption. Why? Because when we put tariff, that means we are not getting the goods from China, but lo locally we are producing the goods, but now the cost is more because we are not that efficient as China to produce that good. So the cost is more and as a result, the price is higher and consumption from the consumers decreases. Another um, effect is it misallocate resources domestically away from efficient production. So misallocation of resources. And finally, it harms foreign producers who are efficient but provide domestic governments with increased revenue through tariffs. So, you know, the foreign producers are affected significantly. But again, uh, if you think from the uh, government side, they get extra revenue from the tariff, right? There's extra tax. So that goes to the government. So a nation has an absolute or disadvantage, absolute advantage or disadvantage in trade relative to each factor of production, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneur. Like U.S. has an intensity of trade in land products. What that means is intensity of trade means basically a country has an abundant per resource. Let's say a country has an abundant labor. So that means our U.S. has abundant land. That means U.S. has intensity of trade in land of products, in, in the land products. So basically, U.S. has a lot of land. So they have the intensity to trade um, goods that are produced using these lands. You know, they have such as grains, capital intensity in production of medical equipment, computers, chemicals, and etc. Okay. So a nation's export supply curve shows the quantity it will export at world prices that exceed domestic prices in a closed, no trade economy. While a nation's import demand curve reveals the quantity a nation will import at world prices below the domestic price. And where these two curves intersect, that is the equilibrium price and quantity in the trade market. So that is the end of lecture 15. This week we are only going to look into this lecture. Uh, and in the next week, we will focus on lecture 16, which is our last uh, class week, and then we will have the exam. So if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, you guys stay safe. Thank you.